Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today is the East Bay Regional Park District Board Operations Committee meeting. It's July 27th, 2021. And our apologies for starting a little late due to my technical difficulties. I'll be joining by phone today. It is 12, uh, 1238. And um, I would like to ask our board secretary to let people know how they can participate in today's meeting. Certainly, thank you. So members of the public that wish to make a comment or join the meeting may do so in one of three ways. They can send an email to boardopscommittee at ebparts.org. They can leave a voicemail at 510-544-2500, or they can join live via Zoom with the link that is included in the agenda, which is posted on the district website. Thank you very much. And we are coming to you pursuant to Governor Newsom's executive order that allows us to conduct our meetings uh, online, being phone and video conferencing. So thank you to all of you who are participating and taking a look at today's agenda. Let's go ahead and have the roll call. Director Wieskamp? Here. Director Eccles? Present. Director Corbett? Here. AGM O'Connor? Here. And staff presenters and participants joining us today include Ruby Tumber, Captain Ellen Love, Andrew Green, Ann Castlebaum, Dan Cunning, David Kendall, Eric Bowman, Ira Bletz, Jeff Rasmussen, Kim Tai, Captain Lance Breed, Noah Dort, Patty Gorshnik, Renee Patterson, Robert Kennedy, Sonia Gomez, Steve Castile, and Tiffany Margolisi. Thank you very much and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, the entire committee is here and plenty of our wonderful staff as well. Looking forward to hearing from you all today. Um, the next item on the agenda is review of the University of California 4-H special use agreement at Ardenwood Historic Farm. And uh, Chair Corbett, I'm just gonna pass this off to our staff member, Renee Patterson who's got the lead on uh, this item. So, Renee? Great. Hello, Renee. Thank you. Hello. Uh, good afternoon, Chairperson Director Corbett and Directors Wieskamp and Eccles. And thank you, Jim. I'm Renee Patterson. I'm an admin analyst in business services. And I am going to share my screen for this presentation. If you would let me know if you can see the presentation. Yes, Jim. Thank you. Yes. All right. So oh, let me change one thing. Oop, sorry. Um, all right. So today we're here to review the regents of the University of California 4-H Youth Development Program Special Use Agreement at Ordenwood Historic Farm. Also here today for any questions you may have um, is Tiffany Margulisi, the business services manager and my supervisor. Uh, we have from Ardenwood, Ira Blitz and Sonia Gomez. And also from uh, the 4-H program uh, Bayside, Julie Ferrario. So an overview of what we're going to do today is first we'll discuss what a special use agreement is, then uh, look at the location that 4-H program is uh, using at Ardenwood Farm. A little bit of background as to uh, their use at the farm. Um, a couple of uh, points of the agreement and then the staff recommendation. So special use agreements uh, must meet the district objectives with appropriate public benefit and priority. Uh, special use agreements are defined as any ongoing recreational development, activity, service, or land use that is provided for group and general public benefit by clubs, associations, or similar groups operating as nonprofit entities with membership open to the public. 
Currently, the district has 23 special use agreements. So here's the location you can see in within the red circle on the Ardenwood map on the left that um, the area they use is uh, in the farmyard area where animals are kept uh, within pens. And on the right, it shows the actual location of the pens in blue. The darker blue uh, rectangle is where the stack room is that they get to use. It's actually split into two rooms. And then they have an additional rotation animal pen for their use. So a little bit of background, we have some 4-H history. Uh, the 4-H 4-H idea is a uh, practical and hands-on learning came from the desire to make public school education more connected to country life. And the 4-H's stand for hand, head, heart, hands, and health. And this represents the values that members work on throughout the year. Um, they've been giving a uh, voice to express who they are and how they make their lives and communities better. And have an ultimate goal of giving you the skills they need to thrive and succeed throughout their lives. So the Ardenwood plan specifically noted 4-H as a weekend program in uh, the 1987 Ardenwood business plan. And they suspected that 4-H would have the greatest growth potential and visitor use. So Ardenwood uh, at the farm itself, 4-H has been there since approximately 2015. There's two groups participating there now. One is called Bayside, they're based in Fremont, and the other is Crane Ridge, which is based in Livermore. The public benefit of the program is it increases the number of animals on site for the public to view. It also offers offers opportunities for young folks to relate to farming by seeing other young folks taking care of animals. And it also promotes volunteerism of the 4-H participants who work closely with Amanda de Borba, who is the farm technician at Ardenwood and also participate in programs at Ardenwood. So the actual use for 4-H is they have use of up to seven pens in the main farmyard for rearing livestock with a 10 by 10 sheltered work area and a large tack room, which is actually two tack rooms and which they store feed, cleaning supplies and equipment. This is um, two pictures of the pen area that they have use of. And the agreement, as I said, it's for um, parts of the main farmyard for rearing livestock, the sheltered work area and the tack rooms. It's for, um, we're proposing five years plus five years. And the recommendation is Park District staff recommends that the Board Operations Committee approve and recommend to the full board a special use agreement with the Regents of the University of California or HU development program for initial term of five years with an option to extend the term of the agreement for one five year period. And if you have any questions, Ira and Sonia and Tiffany are here to give you any details you'd like. As well as Julie Ferrario from 4-H. Okay, thank you very much. Um, what any of the uh, mentioned staff members like to add a little bit more? Ira or anyone else? Um, this is Ira Bletz, Regional Interpretive and Recreation Services Manager. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Chairperson Corbett. Uh, I would just like to say that the 4-H program has a tremendous benefit for the public and for the park. By having the 4-H students there, as Renee uh, mentioned, increases the number of animals on display for the public without uh, giving the responsibility of caring for those animals to Ardenwood staff, which frees up the staff to care for other, other animals that are, belong to the district and also to work on other projects around the farm. 
It also, uh, this, the young people are also required to work with Amanda DeBorba, the, the farmer one at Ardenwood, and put in volunteer hours, not taking care of their areas, but helping Amanda with other projects. And so there's, there's give back to the district for use of this space. And as Renee mentioned, we have the added bonus of young people visiting the farm, see other young people uh, volunteering, taking care of animals, and it increases interest in both the 4-H program and also the idea of volunteering for Park District. So it's a real, um, real positive relationship uh, on both ends. Wonderful. What a great opportunity uh, to allow young people to learn more about how, how to take care of livestock and where food comes from and all those sort of things. Um, I can't see people since I'm coming in by phone. So is there anyone else from staff who would like to add anything in addition before I turn to board members for comments? And Director Corbett, uh, I will handle the uh, hands for you and let you know if anybody has their hand up to speak. Okay. <laughs> Great. Thank you. And at this point, no staff has additional comments. Okay. Thank you. Would any board members like to make any comments? I know, Anne, this is in your district. I'm sure you have something you'd like to add. Well, I think it's fantastic. I um, certainly approve of 4 H. While we have some critters living in Livermore that are being taken care of, I would say about 100 feet away, there's a gentleman and his kids who are raising several chickens, which he has well protected. So there's a lot of interest in Livermore, even within the city. I guess I would like to hear from the representative from 4-H and uh, what they're thinking, how they, how they feel about the program and its benefits. Oh, yes, please. Would you like to make a comment? We'd love to hear from you. The person from 4-H. Yes, hello, my name is Julie Ferrario. Um, thank you, uh, Board Operations Committee members and uh, Director Corbett. Um, as a member or as, as the club leader for Bayside 4-H, I, rep I, I recognize what a wonderful opportunity this is for any of our youth members, for anyone who's in the area of Fremont, Union City, Newark, to access uh, the opportunity to raise an animal, learn these life skills. Um, most of us around this area only are able to, we, we can't raise an animal in our own backyard. I mean, maybe a couple of chickens, but we cannot raise these animals and learn these particular skills because we just don't have the space or the, the zoning for it. So having this uh, ability to go to Ardenwood, to take our urban and diverse, culturally diverse members, bring them to Ardenwood and have them be able to do something that's rural, that's usually limited to those who are living in another um, area like Pleasanton or Livermore, but we're able to do that here and we can you know, take these animals to the fair, um, learn all kinds of ways to show them um, you know, learn showmanship skills, but also learn about, you know, budgeting, um, learning how to, um, you know, respect the animal, make sure that all of its needs are met. I mean, there's just, there's wonderful skills that these kids are learning and absolutely that they're, they're influencing their peers. The reason that my kids got into this program was specifically because we would go to toddler time at Ardenwood led by Ira Blitz, and we would see that there's, oh, wow, there's there's 4-H animals here. So my kids, I have three children, and they are all involved in the, the raising market um, goats and sheep at Ardenwood. I mean, it's just been wonderful. Um, and I'm, I'm welcome to answer any questions that anyone might have for me, but I just think that this is a win-win for our community and also for Ardenwood and for the Park District. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Ferrario. Thank you for your activism and yeah. this very important opportunity to teach young people things they might not otherwise be able to see without your, without your help. Thank you. Any other board members have any questions or comments? Sure, I'll just jump in and say I, this is like a wonderful program and I particularly appreciate the opportunity for um, children who don't live anywhere near a farm to be able to come and, and learn these skills and learn more about the animals and caring for the animals. So I, I just think this is a, a really great partnership. 
Thank you very much. And uh, the fact that this is a, a public place, uh, hopefully it will grow your members, Ms. Ferrario, just like you said, <laughs> someone may see it and uh, decide to join and become part of 4-H. I think that that's a really nice part of it as well. Anyone else have any comments or questions? I'll say right. thumbs up. Terrific. Okay. No other hands, Dr. Sounds Corbin. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sounds great. Sounds great to me. Um, uh, so a motion is in order to support the, um, let me just get the exact language, support our approval of the special use agreement with the University of California 4-H program at Ardenwood. Uh, would anybody like to make that motion? I would love to. Okay, yes. moved by Director Wieskamp. Second. Seconded by Director Eccles. Please call the roll on the measure. Director Eccles? Aye. Director Wieskamp? Aye. Director Corbett? Aye. It's unanimous. Congratulations, and uh, thank you for all you're doing. Thank you, Ira, especially for getting it, keeping it going and expanding. Okay. I have to give credit yeah. to Sonia for that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. That helps us be able to continue to call Ardenwood a historic farm. <laughs> so thank you for that, too. <laughs> All right. Well, if there are no other comments on that, thank you to our uh, participants and speakers. Thanks, and, Mark. Uh, we can, thank you. And we can move on to the next item, which is number item number three, which is a review of the Carquina Straits communication site replacement and agreement at the Carquina Strait Regional Shoreline. And. Uh, Dr. Corbett, just a couple of words of introduction, then I'll hand it off to uh, Tiffany Margolisi, our business services manager. But one of the things, uh, the district plays an important role uh, from a regional standpoint because of the lands we own and the critical points, uh, high points that we actually own, a lot of our um, peaks and uh, ridge lines that we uh, own throughout the district in terms of public safety communications. The item today is another one of those items where we're playing a, uh, a cooperating role with other agencies in supporting public safety communications uh, and government communications uh, regionally. And um, so, and, and we do quite a bit of that throughout the district. So with that, I'll pass it off to Tiffany. Uh, she'll take it from here. Welcome, Tiffany. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And. Um, uh, I have, uh, as uh, uh, AGM O'Connor said, uh, this is really a, uh, an item that has a lot of uh, impact on emergency communications. And as such, of quite a team uh, supporting today, we have Captain Breed, Captain Love, uh, Patty Gershanik, who is our staff uh, communications records and property manager. Uh, Kim Tai from planning, uh, has a senior planner, has also worked extensively on this project along with uh, Renee Patterson. Uh, we also have the park supervisor, uh, Dave Kendall, and Dan Penning, the unit manager, uh, as well as several guests from Contra Costa County uh, who will be here to speak and answer questions uh, after I present the item. So I just wanted to acknowledge the team uh, before I started my presentation. And with that, I will share my screen and we'll get going. One moment. Okay, and do I need to switch that? Right. There we go. Okay, so um, this is the Kirkina Strait communication site replacement and I already introduced the team. So for the presentation, I will be going over what the existing sites are and there's two different existing sites. One is a Contra Costa County site being replaced and one is a site on, currently at Kirkina Strait uh, shoreline also being replaced. And then I'll talk about the replacement site and what the public benefits are, the benefits both to the park district and the larger region, um, as well as the timeline and then our recommendation. 
So from the Contra Costa County side, Contra Costa County approached us uh, quite a while ago now, uh, letting us know that they have a large building at Pine Street, 651 Pine Street, which is this tall building here, uh, which is, um, needs to be demolished. And it will be replaced with a two-story building, which would not be tall enough to uh, house the emergency communications, which are currently on top of the building. Um, it is a current EBRIC site. It's a site for um, the county sheriff, uh, county fire, as well as the uh, regional um, medical communication. Um, in turn, Contra Costa County did an extensive search uh, in the area as to what options they would have to replace uh, the communication site at 651 Pine Street. There are not that many options. In fact, um, there was not an alternate option. Uh, this is the um, only suitable location that Contra Costa County was able to identify. Within Carquina Strait Regional Shoreline, uh, there is an existing 25 foot tower uh, that is a KQED tower and uh, they, KQED has leased uh, from the park district. This uh, map here, the red star, shows where it is uh, within the park, just to orient. And um, here is a um, little bit more of an up-close plan of where the replacement site is proposed. So uh, we have this access road uh, which comes into the park. Um, it's on City of Martinez property, who's also been approached and supportive of this project. We have the existing KQED tower, and uh, that tower would be demolished and uh, replaced with a 50-foot tower and a 360-square-foot equipment building uh, right across the way, right in the same uh, vicinity of this access road. Um, there would also be uh, completed by Contra Costa County improved access road up to the site. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit, we have some visual simulations coming next so everyone can see that the, um, even though the tower is increasing, uh, the visual impacts are pretty minimal. The benefits of doing this um, are that the eBRICS coverage that is currently at 651 Pine Street is maintained and it's actually expanded. So we use, uh, utilize the eBRIC system. Uh, we're part of that partnership. And uh, this location is actually better in terms of coverage. In addition, uh, Contra Costa County is going to be uh, providing low band radio space, uh, rack space within this uh, new tower. And that will be at no cost uh, to the park district. So it's extremely valuable uh, in terms of closing gaps in the low band radio coverage uh, for park operations. The KQED lease would remain intact and we've been involving KQED in all of these discussions. Uh, the KQED rent would continue to be paid uh, to the park district and provided in the building at no cost. So there's no cost to the park district um, except for staff time. And we, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there would be an improved access road. In addition to these benefits, the county is uh, proposing to pay an annual fee, $1,200, which would increase by a $300 every five years. And uh, this is a, a, a diagram of what it looks like. Um, this is where the existing KQED tower is. Um, this is the new footprint, the equipment building, and the 50-foot tower. This is an access road. And as I'll show you in the next slide, um, this is not in the vicinity of any hiking trails. This is not currently a hiking trail. This is just an access road for the tower. Um, it's not within the uh, public use area. Here's some visual simulations uh, completed by Contra Costa County. This is the view from the California Riding and Hiking Trail. So this is the closest point that a, a hiker or biker or rider uh, would be able to uh, get uh, to the site on trail. So on the left is the existing site as it stands today. And then um, on the left and then on the right, uh, there's a visual simulation of the proposed site. So you can see that it is, a, uh, it is taller and there is a building here, um, but uh, we think it still blends pretty well into the landscape. 
Likewise, there's a simulation from uh, Alhambra Street at D Street. And uh, this one is even, I think, harder to detect. So this is the, the, really the only place the public uh, from the city of Martinez can view this site. So on the left is the existing tower as it is today. I'm moving my cursor around it. You can see it. And on the right, if it were to be a, uh, the 50 foot tower as proposed, um, that's what it looks like. And I don't know, I, I don't have the greatest eyesight, but I don't see any difference. Um, I think it's at, at a distance that it's really uh, very comparable. So the timeline uh, on this is the county has already been doing uh, the initial due diligence to make sure this site is suitable and appropriate and working closely with our planning staff. Um, this is a uh, project that's exempt under CEQA and the county filed their notice of exemption and the, um, filed the comment period uh, has closed uh, with no comments. And um, Kim Tai is here from uh, planning if there's any questions about that process. And uh, the proposal uh, before, the, uh, before the directors today is that um, if it's approved by the board of directors, it would go to the full board in September. And the county is looking to move forward with constructing uh, po possibly as early as this fall. Uh, they're already doing some site reconnaissance um, survey work uh, through a, a temporary park access permit uh, in hopes that this would get approved. So to recap the recommendation, the park district staff recommends the board of director, uh, the board operations committee approve and recommend to the full board the authorization of an agreement with Contra Costa County to construct the site and then uh, when completed to lease and occupy the site and use park district land for the construction, operation, maintenance and management of a tower and related equipment structure for a maximum of 25 years. The county will pay $1,200 per year and there would be no cost to the park district for the agreement. And with that, I'll pause uh, for questions. And um, as I said, we have a number of different um, representatives uh, who can help me if I don't know the answer. Okay, thank you very much for that presentation. Um, any questions or comments by board members? Yeah, I, I have a question, Inspector Eccles. Um, and Tiffany, thank you very much for the presentation. And certainly this is a very important project. I'm interested to know that you said that there, there were no alternatives. If there were what what alternatives were explored, if any, and rejected? Great. Um, so for that question about alternatives, um, I don't know who from the county would like to answer that. Maybe Wayne uh, Tilly. Would you like to answer that question about what alternatives the county considered? I apologize. It helps when you unmute before you try to answer the question. Um, we actually looked at a couple of potential locations. Um, it would have taken two additional towers in order to cover the same area. There was one that had looked at if we could use some areas within Martinez or within Benicia, and then there was some other locations we were looking at within um, the the. Martinez area down by the sheriff, down by um, for us from your mirror road. Um, it just having multiple towers adds to the complexity. It also adds to that potential failover or that what if scenario if something were to happen. So having a single point that is easily accessible to cover the geographical footprint that this tower would be able to cover has a huge benefit to the county, to Ebrix, and to the regional park district. Thank you. Any other mm -hmm. comments or questions from board members? I I have a few questions. Director uh, Director Corbett, Director I Wieskamp, know. Director Wieskamp has her hand up. That's Director Wieskamp. It seems like it is the logical thing to do, the least invasive as far as visual. Am I correct in that? Yes, I, I think um, the county has uh, worked hard to 
make it as compact as possible. We went through a couple different iterations um, to really um, make it have the smallest footprint feasible. And um, just to reiterate, this is only going to house emergency services uh, other than KQED, which is the existing uh, lessee at the site. So um, this is going to be very uh, focused for those purposes. And Director Wieskamp, you know, part of our evaluation of the county's proposal was the fact that we actually already had a tower here. We already had a visual impact uh, and a potential environmental impact footprint. So that was part of our thinking along the lines of why we um, agreed to move forward with the process. And also we did request them to go through the CEQA process uh, so that we covered that base also. Well, it seems to me that they've taken extra steps to do the very best possible in finding an excellent location. It's obvious that we all need the service and I certainly approve of K2AD being included. Thanks. Okay, I, I have a few uh, questions. One is, um, I did hear that uh, the idea is to only have emergency services uh, on this new tower. Is the um, agreement going to be written strictly enough to show that uh, there's not an opportunity for others to add on? That it will strictly be uh, public safety and uh, emergency services and KQED. I'm just yes. looking to the future in case someone decides they want to um, lease space on it. Yes, that is correct. We will uh, specify that, and also um, based on the size of it, there is not excess uh, space. But certainly, we will be explicit about the purpose and uh, intent of the site in the agreement. Okay, great. And then in the CEQA process, I, I think I heard you say there were no comments. We haven't heard from um, any individuals or neighbors that are concerned about uh, how it will uh, impact them. That, that's correct. There were no comments uh, received and um, the county has also been in contact with the city of Martinez uh, because the access road is on their property and um, have uh, Mar city has been supportive as well. Okay. And then again, the rent uh, will go to the park district, which will include $2,100 a month from KQED and $1,200 per year from the county as a license increasing to $300 a year per five years. Is that, is that the total amount? So I'll clarify, um, that's a good question. I'll clarify the $2,100 a month is the value that um, we're the park district to try to go out and find space for ourselves and for KQED okay. to be on, a, um, to, to have that rack space. Um, that's what we would have to pay uh, where we estimate we would have to pay based on market uh, if we were to go yeah. out and find that type of service. So that's the um, kind of in-kind value of the agreement. All right. And so what does Kate, what's the, what's the total amount of income coming from this and from whom? Let me do a quick uh, total on that. And uh, maybe there's some other questions we can get to. I'll get right back to you on that. Okay, thanks. My question will always be, I always ask this question when we look at uh, licenses on towers is whether we are competitive with what is usually charged out in the market. And um, I think it would be a good idea at some point to do a, a study on that and see, you know, what the market calls for so that we have that as we, you know, into the future continue to um, you know, uh, use licenses, you know, have licenses approved and um, continued on, on the many towers that we have, because this is not the only tower in the park district. That's so right. So it would be nice just to do the research so we have it. So when it comes time to um, approving, um, you know, upping 
annual leases and five-year leases, et cetera, that we have that information so we can make sure that we're, the park district is not getting a gift of public funds uh, when we uh, allow people to station their equipment on, on towers within the district. And Director Corbett, I, I believe it was in 2019, we did, actually did conduct a um, public agency survey and uh, regarding okay. tower uh, revenue, and uh, we'll share that with committee member yourself and the other committee members. Yeah, and it would be good to look at beyond uh, what public agencies charge and see what's charged on other towers that private entities get for, for uh, using such space too. I think that that would be important to know as well. Yeah. We agree. And um, just to get back to your earlier question um, for KQED, they pay a rent of $8,113 per year. So combined with the county's um, uh, fee, it would be $9,313 uh, per year. And um, we uh, have uh, Renee uh, Patterson has done some recent market research as well, in addition to what AGM O'Connor referenced. Um, this is, uh, we have 17 comm sites at the park district, and um, one is our own site and one is a public site. Uh, the rest are private entities. Um, but in comparing with um, public, other public sites or public benefit sites, um, this is, uh, we determined that this was within um, the range. And then also considering um, if, if you add in, so the, the uh, income from the site is uh, almost $10,000, $9,313. And then if you take into account the value of the no cost uh, rack space as well, um, that's a value yes. of over $10,000. Okay. So I have two last questions. One is, uh, who will be paying for the maintenance of the tower? Contra Costa County will uh, maintain the tower and the road. Okay, and that includes the security of the tower as well? Yes, they will be responsible and we have uh, standard language and uh, expectations in terms of uh, keeping it in, in good condition. Okay, and then I noticed, this is my last question, um, that the, in the report says, county is currently undertaking the topographic review and geotechnical investigation of the site through a park district temporary access permit. Do we have any issues of concern regarding to, uh, geotechnical issues and the safety of the tower? No, there's been no concerns uh, raised so far. They're just uh, getting, this is the logical next step um, in the process. Uh, Wayne from Contra Costa County, do you wanna elaborate any more on the geotechnical uh, work currently being done? Um, yeah, I believe that <clears throat> they had completed the geotechnical survey for that location. We did not have any issues with the site or potential wind issues or the land and compaction uh, for that location at all. I actually have a copy of the report if you would like me to send it to you. Uh, I'll take your word for it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But thank you. We do, we do, of course, want to make sure it's safe. If yeah, it is. It, safe. It, yep, it is safe. Okay. We don't want it to topple if we have an earthquake or something. <laughs> <laughs> no, right. that won't happen. Sounds, sounds good. Okay. Sounds good. All right, that's my last question. Thank you, everybody. Does anybody else have any additional comments? Do our public safety folks want to speak up on the importance of it at all? Or Captain Love has his hand up. Okay, please, Captain Love. Good afternoon, Captain Love um, from the East Regional Park District Police Department. Uh, I wanted to lend all support to this project. It does expand coverage for police and firefighting in that area. Or is the, uh, the increased rack space will increase the coverage in low bandwidth for our park operation department. Um, and there's a uh, benefit to the park district that we will directly see. And I don't know if you wanted to have comments uh, about rack space uh, or the how uh, valuable that rack space is in the, in the park district. Okay, very good. Thank you for sharing that. That's very important. 
And good to know. Thank you. Any other uh, comments, questions? If not, a motion's in order on this item as well to approve um, the uh, uh, motion to approve the agreement for the Carquina Strait Regional Shoreline Carquina Strait Communications site replacement. And moved. Okay, moved Second. by Director Eccles. Second. Second by Director Wieskamp. Please call the roll. Director Wieskamp? Aye. Director Eccles? Aye. Director Corbett? Aye. Unanimous. It goes next to the board, right? Thank you. Yes. Correct. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. All right. And then our next item, item four, is the district wide resident program update on a duplex conversion for some of our uh, housing facilities. I know Director Wieskamp has worked hard on this issue. So mm -hmm. thank you for bringing this for us. And uh, I'm just going to pass this off to Tiffany. She's done a lot of work in this area and uh, she's ready to go. All right. Thank you, Tiffany. Here I go. Thank you. All right. I'm pulling up my slideshow. You've got the notes page. There we there go. We All right. So um, this is the, uh, we, we've uh, just recently completed uh, at the direction of the um, ad hoc residence committee uh, that met in 2020 with directors Wieskamp and directors Rosario. Um, we met over the course of uh, four meetings in 2020 and took a very deep dive into the residence program. And one of the uh, directions and action items uh, from those discussions was to look at three different uh, park residences and determine um, which might be the best option for um, trying to uh, have a duplex. And uh, with the idea of you know, really being able to fully utilize uh, some of these larger residences uh, that we have through recent acquisitions. So I'll be presenting uh, what we have uh, have found so far what we're recommending and um, then be very open to discussion. These are the three photos of the locations uh, that were chosen as being potentially large enough and feasible enough to look at. So 6363 Redwood Road, uh, known as the Albanese House, uh, Pinehurst Road Residence, also known as the McCosker House, and 10 Tehan Canyon, uh, part of Pleasanton Ridge, uh, known as the Glen property. So um, the goal of this study was to look at a very high level about the cost and feasibility for subdividing three residences and then recommend the best option. We had a study team, uh, which consisted of a consultant from Fog Studios, who does uh, architectural uh, work, uh, including uh, and then uh, internally um, from staff from MAST, Finance and Management Services, as well as Business Services. And here's some more pictures of the three subject um, properties. So I would just thought I would lead with the executive summary, sort of where uh, we're recommending to go. And then um, I'm gonna go back and I'll talk about each one in detail. And then of course, we'll have the um, opportunity to discuss. So at a very high level, um, we looked at all three and uh, for Redwood Albanese, we're looking at a office upstairs and residence downstairs. Um, for Pleasanton Ridge, Teeth and Canyon, that's what we're uh, found, what staff is thinking would be the best for the duplex pilot program. And then Sibley Pinehurst or McCosker, um, our recommendation would be to keep it as is, as a single family, or possibly uh, move the current SCA, the current. Student Conservation Corps crew there. So that's just the high level. And now I'm gonna go through each one and we'll have a chance to discuss. So first for Redwood, um, the um, Albanese house. Um, currently the house is occupied by a lease back uh, caretaker who lived there prior to our acquisition. They live in the lower level. It's a 3,102 square foot, two bedroom, two bath. And it has its pr pretty much already set up with its own unit uh, downstairs. Um, we, uh, throughout this study, we um, took into account that we have a very high demand for office space and field office space. And out of these three locations that we looked at, this is really the one that would be best suited for that type of use. 
And so that's why we are um, recommending to have the upstairs uh, be an office. Um, the location has parking for seven to nine cars. So that is why we wouldn't recommend it being um, office upstairs and downstairs, because even though there's space within the house for lots of desks, um, there wouldn't be space enough um, to really have it be used as two offices. So it'd be kind of the best of both worlds, having a security presence downstairs. It's right near a trailhead into Redwood Park and then um, have the uh, office space be upstairs. Um, there is an evaluation and cost estimate uh, in progress for the retaining wall, uh, balcony, and septic. And I'll show you some of those pictures. And I'm sorry, Director Corbett, you don't get to see the pictures. But I will be sharing um, the full report um, with the committee. And so you can look at these um, in detail. Um, these photos I'm showing are of the um, exterior. And this is uh, what we're having evaluated right now by a civil engineer, the front retaining wall, the separating front walkway. And uh, for Director Corbett, you can't see it. There's a nice balcony uh, that uh, lines the house that's just visibly separating. Uh, there's just a visible uh, crack in it. So we're having an engineer evaluate that for safety <coughs> and repair. Um, here, uh, there's a picture of the retaining wall, which is leaning over, and then the septic tank. And uh, as I learned from my colleagues in MAST, apparently the septic tank is not supposed to be showing like that. So um, I didn't know that. And um, there it is. So it's showing in the picture. Um, so that is, uh, we're having a um, septic evaluation done. So the retaining wall, the, um, the cracking balcony, and the septic, all of those need to be addressed. Uh, no matter what the ultimate use is. So right. staff is proceeding with getting those items looked at and getting cost estimates. Um, here is the lower level, uh, which shows the current living unit. So already set up as a living unit would just need to be sealed off uh, from the upstairs. And then here's some more pictures of the upper level unit and it's beautiful, uh, lots of windows. Uh, main entry stairs uh, here and um, uh, could be suitable for, um, for desks. And you'll see in the report, it has a much larger capacity for desks than it does for parking. So uh, we just, uh, have, to we just have to keep really going back parking. to that. Yeah. <laughs> the other um, consideration for this location is that it does not provide ADA access. So it cannot be a, um, uh, and it would be I think impossible, but certainly cost prohibitive to, to do ADA here. There need to be some sort of elevator or something. Um, so this would need to be for a work group um, that would uh, not have public, um, you know, not, not be a public facing facility, but could be a staff facility. So I'll pause there on uh, this location and see if there's any specific questions about this location before I move on. Um, Tiffany, I'm, I'm just curious, uh, this is Director Eckle, um, so would you leave that large kitchen upstairs with the offices or what would you propose to do? I think um, we, so that, so th this is like I said, it's very high level, so I think we don't know exactly the layout, but it could generally be like a break, a break room area and leave it intact and that's a really nice feature to have um, in a staff office is, is to have um, to have a break room area. So the the from what we've seen so far, without you know really going to the next stage, um, there wouldn't need to be a lot of interior modifications. It would just really be about getting the um, internet uh, hooked up, the high speed internet, and um, getting an appropriate layout for uh, phones and, and desks with maybe some minor modifications. That's beautiful space. Yes. Yeah, Director Eccles, to your question, I mean, obviously if we were designing an office, uh, a staff space, this would be certainly overkill uh, in terms of their needs for a, a kitchen and break room facility, but uh, we're gonna work with what we have. <laughs> Yeah, it's very no, nice. I, I, absolutely, I, I wouldn't want you to rip that out, and you know, and if you, yeah, yeah, it's very nice. Yeah. Director right. Rieskamp has her hand up. Yes, Director Rieskamp. I think it's an excellent location for office space for our staff. 
in that park area. I mean, I can see that working very nicely. Um, do we have one or two uh, restrooms upstairs? Great you... question. Um, let me look back to my- oh, Probably it would have so few people working there, it wouldn't be an issue. That's right. Yeah, it's, it's um, two bathroom in total. So one is downstairs and one is upstairs. I think that that's fine. That seems like an excellent combination. And as you say, you've got to make all those improvements no matter what. And right. right, just a reminder that um, we're still doing evaluation. So this is certainly not it. And, and we need to run this to the GM um, before we bring it to the full board for approval. Uh, but we'll be doing that evaluation on the, the infrastructure. And then uh, also just a, a, a comment, Director Wieskamp is that you know, we've over the last several years have been at the board's direction, been expanding our volunteer program, uh, support for volunteer uh, use in uh, parks uh, and our Parks Express program, or we call our, our Parks um, Transportation program has expanded significantly in the last few years. And those staff are just busting at the seams over at the Redwood Park office. So it's, it's gonna be a, a point where um, we're really limited in terms of if we are going to expand volunteer, the volunteer program and the support staff for that program, uh, this would really help uh, with that effort. I can see that, that makes sense. Thank you. On, the, is, on the housing It is beautiful. Space. Oh, sorry. On the housing space, and I'm sorry you may be showing this and I can't see it, <laughs> but uh, on the housing space part of it on the downstairs, uh, how many people would it accommodate? The downstairs um, would be suitable. I have it here. Um, it would be suitable. It's a studio. So it'd be suitable for a, a couple or um, perhaps a couple with a small, a, a little one, I think up to three potentially. There okay. is a parking space for two um, for two cars, and it is spacious, but it is um, a studio apartment. Not a it's not a uh, formal one bedroom. Okay, all right. Thank you for that. Any other questions? And Tiffany, I will watch the recorded meeting so I can see all the pretty pictures. Okay, <laughs> and yeah, I'm happy. I'm happy to send them to you. The other um, thing to consider with it being a studio, which is a good, um, I, I think, you know, not the main driving factor here, but just is, is something good to note is that since it is a smaller space, um, it does also uh, keep the rent more affordable. Uh, we had it appraised for market rent appraisal and it's really based on price per square foot for the area. And um, this is a very, um, you know, Oakland uh, tends to be a very high rent area. So I think that with the uh, studio space and then the nuisance reduction, um, this would be a great uh, staff location, employee residence yes. location. Okay. So especially then, for who works in the office upstairs. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Someone could commute uh, downstairs. Yes. <laughs> Um, okay, so um, I'll move on to the second one uh, that we looked at, which is Sibley Pinehurst McCosker. This is a really large residence, three bedroom, three bath, over 4,000 square feet. Um, this location is currently in use as the construction field office for the McCosker Creek Restoration Project through the end of this year. So when uh, the construction field office uh, gets vacated, uh, there'll be a little bit of work to do on the roof. Um, and um, then this would essentially be ready to relist as a park residence. For this location, we examined three options. One was single family, one was duplex, and we even looked at the triplex option, uh, which was found not to be feasible, but it is a really uh, large space that we wanted to examine all the possibilities. Um, there's a large basement and lower level and um, initially we had thought that would be the location for a secondary uh, uh, dwelling unit or, or you know, duplex, um, but that is very, would be very expensive and infeasible to turn into living space. So I'll show those next, um, but the duplex option would be a small studio. So here's some pictures of the existing conditions. And um, over here, um, there's a separate stairs on the outside, which go up to an upper unit, uh, which could be converted into a studio. 
and it would be a, a, a you know compact uh, living situation, uh, but could could easily be done. Um, there's some deck repairs that are needed, uh, regardless of duplex or single family, and there's just some general pictures of the exterior. Um, this is showing the uh, lower level unit, which is really the main unit, and um, it's it's fine. It has uh, dining, you know, all the usual stuff: main bath, kitchen. Um, it's in, it's all fine. Everything's they they said it was dated but serviceable, so <laughs> everything was was fine. And then here are the pictures of the upstairs. Uh, if we were to do a duplex here. It would be this upstairs, a smaller separate entrance. It's really a large single room um, and we would put in some type of kitchenette. Then uh, concluding with the pictures of the basement, which did seem really promising initially just because it's so big and the ceilings are really high, um, but it is um, concrete walls and the um, doors or the windows are not the right um, height for code compliance. And it just was determined to be really uh, cost prohibitive to do anything with this space. So that's what we determined for uh, what we found out from McCosker. So I'll pause there on that one if there's any questions specific to McCosker. Any questions? Any uh, hands up? Uh, yeah, Tiffany's last question, uh, got last comment prompted a question for me. So when you say that it's not code compliant, do you mean it, you couldn't make a separate you know, a separate, well, triplex out of it, um, or do you mean that people can't use it? Because it would certainly, if you kept it a single family, it would certainly be an awesome playroom. <laughs> yes, I know. So uh, um, how uh, Fog Studios explained it and uh, um, is that it's too high to be considered as a formal bedroom or as a formal living room. So if we look at it, part of the large, uh, larger family residence, we have adequate living room, we have adequate bedroom, and then it's like a lot of these spaces, how people choose to use it is how they choose to use it. But we couldn't separate it and call it a bedroom and, or you know, have it be its own unit. I don't know if I explained uh, that. Yeah, well. no, that makes sense. That makes sense. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it, there was, a, we, everyone went in there depending if they had kids, they're like, this is the playroom, if they have music, this is the music room, this is the game room, everyone had a, had that reaction. It's really a good space. <laughs> the other thing that I just want to uh, add in here is that we've had some significant challenges with the uh, water system at this location, which we're hoping we will be um, uh, alleviated with the, the larger restoration project and development project that'll happen in the future with this park area. But it's been a real challenge. Uh, this is a um, Real, I'll just say a real challenging system. I can't recall the exact details, but we've had some real challenges keeping the, uh, the water treatment system working here at this location. So that, that's another thing to consider that this wouldn't be our first priority. All right, so going to the third and final, um, uh, the third location we looked at is in the Pleasanton Ridge Park at 10 Tihun Canyon, and also quite large, 3,550 square feet, three bedroom, three bath, so there's one bedroom uh, downstairs uh, with an existing uh, wet bar. So it already has the foundations that could be transformed into a real kitchen. And then there's two upper levels. So the upper um, unit would, would have two levels and then the separate unit would have one. Um, the uh, septic system and, uh, is being worked on. Uh, the well is being worked on and there's a, a, a deck that needs to be demolished. And similar to some of these big ticket items at the Redwood Albanese house, these are items that have to be done uh, regardless of the ultimate uh, decision of single family or duplex. Um, so those items are in progress. And um, we think that this location uh, would be the most feasible to try out this idea of um, having two families in the same residence. So it's a large home, the semi-public semi road. Um, and here's some uh, exterior pictures. Uh, there's a staircase to the lower unit um, and nice landscaping. And we'd have to define, uh, you know, from a policy or program perspective, 
who parks where and, and all of those types of, uh, you know, definitions for responsibilities. Here's the uh, lower level unit, which is what we're proposing as the smaller separate unit. So there's already a bedroom, the wet bar is here. So um, there's already a fridge, there's already counter space, but there's no um, cooking area, but that wouldn't be too expensive. Um, here's a, one photo of the, the deck that would be demolished. And um, there's still really spacious uh, for the downstairs unit. Then there's pictures of the upper level unit. So they would still have their own dining room, um, large uh, space and a laundry room. And uh, as uh, our consultant said, the finishes are dated, but in good condition. That's the theme. So um, the other uh, advantage of, of uh, using this as our pilot site is just in terms of uh, program administration and how the market rent appraisals um, come in. Um, we did also appraise this one and it, Pleasanton is, is also a high rent uh, area. I didn't know that, um, but by subdividing and having two families here, um, we think we could make the rent um, uh, reasonable that we would be able to get, um, get a good selection. We would be using the parameters of the existing program, existing residence program. So still based on that this is a public benefit program, uh, both residents, uh, both families would have uh, security duties uh, that we would uh, divide. And um, so that's, that's the overview. Um, we're not asking for a formal uh, recommendation or vote today, but we did wanna hear the feedback and, and check in uh, with the, committee at this point in the process and, and get feedback. Great, thank you. When I, sorry, I had one more slide, which I was gonna report back on and then, I, then I'll be really done. So um, I just also wanted to report out since I was talking about the ad hoc committee um, that we did have three main action items from the committee um, and we did have, we have completed all of them. So uh, we did the rental appraisals, We've been working on getting new uh, houses into the program. Uh, so uh, in Las Trampas, the 60 Valley Hill house that's now rented and occupied, uh, Deer Valley Roddy house should be online soon. So we're diligently working to get those additions going. And then uh, we're also continuing to work on the um, campground uh, replacements of residences that need to be replaced, including Anthony Chabot. So. I just wanted to report out on those items uh, as well. And with that, Great. I will stop my share and see what we have to say. Thank you, that was a great report. A lot of great progress. Thank you for the work of the committee as well. So important to make sure we do what we can to help provide affordable housing for our workers. That is a challenge in the Bay Area. So thank you for all of that. Anyone else have any other comments? Yeah, I do. <laughs> Please go ahead. Okay. Thank you, staff, for going forward and doing all that study and work on these three units. I really appreciate it. I had the luxury of seeing all three. And I think um, the Glen property, Pleasanton Ridge, is a very logical choice. Uh, it may be somewhat dated, but let me tell you, that's luxury living for a lot of people. If I remember correctly, the floors were in good condition. Everything was just uh, well kept and uh, could easily be changed in living. And there's an area, um, it has beautiful views and a nice area for children to play too. And I think that's important. And I'm sure you could work out the details for parking. Um, so I like that with the idea of a family and then someone who chose to live in a smaller unit. And uh, obviously all the things that needed to work on, you have to do them anyway. But thank you so much for going to all the trouble to do this. And I think whether at Redwood, you need to use it for staff or volunteers, it doesn't matter. These are all people who are doing things for the district. So again, thanks for all the work, well done. Right. Thank you all. If there's no other comments, our next item is number five, the mast update. 
and the Waste Management Program. And uh, welcome to Mr. Kennedy, who's, um, I don't know if you've presented before to operations, and I'm sorry, I can't see you. <laughs> but I, I hope to sometime soon. <laughs> Please, welcome well, to the meeting. Thank you for having me. Um, and this will be my first time presenting, so yes. Um, so Director Wieskamp, Director Eccles, and Chairperson Corbett, I'm here to give you an update on our solid waste diversion uh, plan. Let me share my screen now so that you can see that. All right, can you all see that? Yes. Okay, all right, let me just minimize that, sorry. Okay, so you really have an outstanding team of folks working on this project. I wanna just recognize the efforts of Andrew Green, Matt Norton and Eric Bowman, who have really set this up and um, you know laid the foundation for the direction that the district is going to be moving. And so I'm going to give you an update on our pilot uh, project and what those results were. In 2018, you know, operations created a waste reduction task force to address the looming state mandates regarding SB 1383 and uh, the state's diversion rate goals. Uh, the district was able to create a refuse can standard, which is what you see here, the uh, fare savers, where we installed 38 of these cans district-wide in 11 different parks. Uh, and we plan to install an additional 36 uh, fare savers just to um, complete the pilot installation. Uh, in addition, we have three streams set up at 80% of our parks throughout the district, and we're working on the other 20% and getting those on board later this year. Uh, there were some cost limitations to getting the, uh, the other remaining 20% on where unit managers said that there just wasn't enough funding for the services at their facilities. And so um, one thing that we wanted to present was that there, was a, there potentially is going to be an ask of $10,000 to be able to get those services online. And if we do that, we'll meet the, the full letter of the law and be in compliance with um, the regulations that are coming down the pipeline. We also received a report from Abbey and Associates that laid out a zero waste action plan uh, where, we can, where we're gonna be utilizing three of the 12 strategies um, to begin this process to formalize district policy related to three string so that we can improve our diversion rate from 38%. Yeah, 38%, 62% of, uh, of waste is still going into the landfill and you know, we have some work to do. It's not a huge mountain to climb, but we'll, we'll get there together. Uh, during this uh, pilot program, Andrew Green was able to uh, negotiate with our haulers and save the district over $188,000 annually. Del Val saw a savings of $80,000. Wildcat Canyon saw a savings of $6,000. Tilden saw a savings of $19,000. And Anthony Chabot saw a savings of $83,000. And that was just negotiating with the haulers um, uh, with their potential increase in costs. So as we get into uh, the three strategies that we want to address, they are related to um, policy. And so we want to bring recommendations to the board ops committee so that we can uh, start to begin the dialogue on how we're going to move in that direction. And so the first policy that we really want to talk about is a mandatory training for district staff. And this would require HR to add a policy number 20 requiring all employees to be trained in waste reduction, recycling, and, and the composting program at the time of onboarding, uh, when they're moving to a new job within the park system or to a new park, and as part of the annual uh, safety academy and biannual training. And this could be a part of the summit program that we already have established here with the district. And there's an estimated one-time cost for this curriculum development at around $10,000. The second policy, $10,000. Thank you. Uh, yes. The second policy um, approach that we're looking at uh, bringing forward and developing is waste reduction for events and venues. And this would require that we ensure that all special events and activities that require permits or reservations have a deposit applied to them and they follow the zero waste, waste guidelines um, when we're using, using reusable or compostable foodware. Um, and then also uh, develop a list of prohibited materials such as styrofoam, confetti, plastic table liners, and heat them. Um, and, develop, and to develop this guideline, we have an estimated cost of about $5,000. The last um, 
policy that we're looking to uh, develop is related to waste reduction for concessionaires, vendors, and caterers. And we want to prohibit concessionaires, food service vendors, and caterers from distributing food using uh, food packaging that is not reusable or compostable. We want to require that all contractors uh, follow the zero waste guidelines and properly separate recyclables and compostable materials. Thing, and we incorporate these requirements into uh, park district agreements. Uh, we currently have these agreements uh, for Bridgeyard and we're using that as a template and a model for how we'll be able to move this forward and using some of that language that Tiffany, and, Tiffany Margolisi and her group have been able to put together. Um, and then we also wanna ensure that uh, park supervisors have the, the support to monitor and enforce these requirements. To develop those guidelines, we're looking at a cost of up to $5,000 as well. Um, so over the next year, we'll be working with our counterparts in HR to finalize these draft policies and vet them through the executive team prior to finalizing them and bringing back to the board walk workshop next year. So um, we will go through a formal process. And so I kept it short and sweet. This is our call to action to continue being a leader in uh, environmental stewardship by not only meeting the diversion rate goals, but by adopting policies that have the potential to divert over 153 tons of waste from the landfill and potentially prevent 178 metric tons of CO2 from entering the atmosphere. But we have to act. And so with that, um, our team is here to take any questions. Do you have any? Thank you very much. Oh my gosh. I wish I was there on the Zoom because <laughs> <laughs> you'd see a big smile on my face. <laughs> <laughs> very uh, wonderful and great proposal and uh, so glad to see that uh, we're moving towards uh, decreasing um, items going to the landfill and uh, your comments with regard to diverting 178 tons from the atmosphere as well. Uh, what a great idea, these various training programs too, to ensure that we can um, have success across the entire district in recycling and um, not only recycling, but reducing waste um, based on agreements with um, concessionaires and um, uh, others, special events folks, uh, like in, and the like. I wanted to just mention real quickly, and then I'll stop so other people can get excited about this. <laughs> but um, uh, several of us uh, did attend uh, an event at Bridgeyard on. Sunday, and it was very, uh, excuse me, Saturday, and it was very nice to see uh, that it was clear that um, the waste from that um, event, uh, for the most part, was compostable. So uh, that was just a very exciting and thrilling thing to see. So obviously, uh, the work that's being done in Bridgeyard as a uh, example or a pilot program uh, appears to be succeeding. So thank you for that. So anybody else want to join in with this exciting news? <laughs> Director Wieskamp has her hand up. Director Wieskamp? Ellen, I remember when we were on the Waste Management Authority <laughs> and, and looking yeah. to make this thing happen. It takes a while to get there, doesn't it? But yeah. <laughs> exciting. I like the idea of attacking it on many levels so that everybody's involved. Anybody else has sound? I don't know who is attacking, but the sound was bad here. I love whoever was our negotiator on working with the hauler. Congratulations to oh them. Gosh. That money can be spent in much better ways. Was that Eric who did that? That was Mr. Andy. Green. Okay, well, let me tell you, we need to put him in places where uh, he can help us in other areas. Haulers are not always easy to work with. I remember that very much from working with some of them. <laughs> so uh, good job. Uh, the training sounds good. Maybe if we're going to bring back our annual little fair, that will be one of the places where we work on this. I don't know whether we're thinking about that maybe by next year. And of course, everything we have there would be compostable or recyclable. We know that. But uh, it's a pleasure to meet you by Zoom, Mr. Kennedy. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you for having me. 
Great, I'll jump in here too since Ellen can't see me. Yes, so I've, got a, I've got a smile big enough for both of us, Ellen. So. <laughs> it's, uh, but but thank, thank you very much, Mr. Kinney. This is all good news, really great report, appreciate it. And I agree that it's important for the park district to be a leader in this area and you know, also to exercise our responsibility to require that, that vendors and events you know, comply with these because this is the direction that all of us have to go to go in, in, in being good stewards. Um, so I was very excited about this report and also want to congratulate Mr. Green on his efforts to save all that money with the hauler. So thank you very much for that. Um, and I, I did have one question on the on the final slide when with the, the specific targets that, that were set, are those um, are those um, percent reductions that we came up with or are those the state the state goals? I'm curious about These are that. the state um, uh, goals um, for waste reduction. Got it. Okay, so so there we we are then adopting them as our goals. I take it. Right. Yeah, we want to align ourselves with the state goals so that we you know we're not only meeting that but the potential to go above and beyond as well. Good, exceeding it. Yes, let's say it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent work. Yeah, very thrilling, very exciting, and I know the rest of the board could be excited about this too. Well, this this is uh, an informational presentation. Will this be shared with the full board as well? I think that would be terrific, Ellen. Good idea. Yeah, and I know Dennis Wasby will be quite excited. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Director Wasby will be very excited about this. I think the whole board will be excited, and there's nothing yeah. wrong with talking about the negotiating for making savings. And all of it together yeah. is just a great message. Uh, Director Corbett, you mind yeah. if I jump in? Yeah, and, and uh, can this be presented to the full board too? Yeah, we'll uh, we'll bring this forward to the to the general manager with a suggestion to bring this forward to a future board meeting. Um, one thing I also want to remind you is that this is an informational update, uh, but the yeah. actual policy changes will go through the general manager's office, and of course, will sure. be presented to the board uh, when they're in their final uh, version. So also, I just. I I'd like to, to predict the vote on that one. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> I, I think we might have a 7 0 vote on that one. I yes. I, I also, I, I just, eight. yeah, there you go. Uh, I just wanted to say also, I just wanted to recognize uh, Madam Chair and the board members that the efforts of Andrew Green and Matt Norton, um, this has been a challenge, even though we have a very strong environmental ethic here at the district. Um, it's been a lot of effort on the part of both Matt and Andrew to work with our park staff because park staff are, are very uh, overworked, uh, especially during the summer. So implementing anything new is often a challenge. Um, and both of them have been very uh, diligent uh, and tenacious uh, to, in trying to push to, uh, and working with staff to hone the program down through the pilot program, to hone down the design uh, and the thinking behind the three stream recycling. So they've done a really great effort, uh, an uphill battle, I would say, uh, swimming against the stream. And uh, it's been a great effort. And uh, we've got now, I think, which is a workable program. And I think we're in a great position to move forward and finally hit those reduction targets. So I'm really proud of both Andrew and Matt for the work they've done under the leadership of Eric uh, and now Robert is taking over that uh, leadership, but it's been a it's been a challenge more than you would expect. Uh, but we're getting there, and I think now we're set up to, for success. So thank you both uh, for all your efforts. I appreciate it. Well, please, and I, you may be on the Zoom call, and I cannot see you, so I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding you. But uh, if you're on the call, um, please know we very much appreciate your work on this, and. Um, this is huge, and um, uh, uh, board members have been asking questions about this for a long time, and we especially appreciate your teamwork, and um, please share this with all the others who have worked on this to uh, move this forward. It is really, it, it is, it's thrilling, it really is, and it's a, like a, Director Eccles said, it's a very important part of our, sort of our philosophy and ethic as, as uh, the East Bay Regional Park District, and we, we like the idea of being leaders and showing others by example what we can do as well. 
And Director Corbett, I know you have a you have a, a hard stop at two o'clock. Well, I'll stay on when till we're done. But, okay. Uh, <laughs> we can keep moving. Any other Great. comments on this fighting issue? I'll I smile. see no hands. <laughs> All right, Ms. Valentine. Any uh, public comments? There she is. Yes, we do have Kelly Abreu. Um, I will be admitting him into the meeting. Okay, three minutes. Welcome, Mr. Abreu. It is now the public comments um, section. You will have three minutes for your comment and your time begins now. Uh, thank you. Um, the, we, we just heard earlier today on the agenda that the University of California wants to do urban agriculture uh, near Ardenwood, um, which, been, which has been going on for a long time. Now they want to expand. I just heard they want to do the SkyWest golf course right next to the Hayward Airport, uh, which is interesting. You know, we want to put our urban agriculture everywhere instead of building housing. Um, so how about if we also do the Livermore Airport? When, uh, urban agriculture right there in Livermore. I know Livermore is very friendly to agriculture, so maybe... That would be uh, an idea. Um, the city council of Fremont had a referral seven months ago. That means they ordered their staff, and more or less an order to their staff to uh, bring back this uh, mission peak lease to the city council for discussion. That was seven months ago. They've done precisely nothing on that. Uh, they brought back nothing. They uh, put nothing on the agenda. They discussed nothing uh, on, a, on any public documents. Um, uh, by the way, uh, Yelp shows uh, one or two, three hundred reviews for uh, Sunol Ridge uh, Regional Park. It shows one or one or two, three hundred reviews for Pleasanton Ridge Regional Park. That's like uh, you know, that's uh, chicken feed. And uh, but, uh, Mission Peak has seventeen hundred reviews on on Yelp. Now they they did bring in uh, at that time last seven months ago. They brought in a parade, a, a nice parade of, of neighbors who had told us all about the problems and what they want. They said uh, too many visitors and it was visitor numbers were growing. Of course, that's incorrect. Since the last five or 60 years ago, um, the park district has broken the trend. The trend has been broken. Visitor, count, uh, visitor numbers have declined. It broke the trend. Uh, once again, remember that phrase, they broke the trend. Um, this is the, uh, they also say that this is the only free entrance around and all the adjacent counties charge fees. That's uh, not correct. Uh, Pleasanton Ridge is free. Uh, Garen is free. Uh, there's a lot of free things that people can walk to. Um, there's even free parking at, uh, at Pleasanton Ridge, for example. So uh, uh, another uh, misconception there, they don't know when they built their own houses. Um, they say that the residential area has existed long before 1978 when the first lease was signed. Uh, if you look at satellite pictures, you'll notice that they had empty fields there in 1978. Um, they also complained that the city built uh, 4,000 housing units near the One Springs BART station, um, and that's their own city council's uh, doing. And uh, then they say that, that, that we shouldn't have this park there because it's going to create traffic. Uh, don't all those people, thousands of people that they're complaining about, don't they need parks and recreation and trails and things? And uh, I would think that uh, having parks nearby would be a good, a good thing. Uh, a board member of Vineyard Heights said that uh, uh, this is not about social justice. Uh, that's laughable. Uh, Vineyard Heights. Uh, Mr. Brew, that's your yeah. time. Great. We look forward to hearing about the Mission Peak Lease. Thank you, Kelly. All right, next item is board comments. Um, uh, I don't have any further comments, but to say this was a another wonderful and amazing operations committee. Everything from agriculture to safety communications to housing and recycling. <laughs> what more can we talk about in this operations committee meeting? It's pretty awesome. Um, and uh, thank you to the staff and everyone involved with everything that we discussed today. Um, Jim, I am going to jump off now. So I am going to ask um, Director Lee's Camp, do you, do you mind sharing the ending of the meeting on my behalf? We'll be glad to, Ellen. Thank you. Okay.
Thank you very much. It was nice uh, talking to and seeing all of you today. Uh, thanks for the great meeting. And I'll see you all soon. Thank you. Sure. Thank Hi. you, Director Corbett. Okay. Jim, is there anything else to add? No, I have no. Um, I am just getting back from vacation. I don't have any additional AGM comments. Thank you very much, Dr. Wieskamp. Okay. Um, Elizabeth, how about you? No, just want to say thank you. I uh, don't need to take up extra time, but, but really do want to express my heartfelt thanks to the staff for a great meeting and all of your hard work on these issues. Thank you, Director Phils. What a feel-good meeting. I mean, people talk about ghastly meetings that they don't want to go to and have such a horrible time. Everything was good today. And uh, you can't always guarantee that, Jim, staff. Yes. But we appreciate it when it happens. So on behalf of all of us, thank you very much. You're and with welcome. that, I have nothing else to add. So I will call the meeting as done. We're going to recess. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Elizabeth.